So good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session. Um, and today we are here to talk about the impact of COVID-19 and how young people can change the narrative um, going forward about COVID-19. Uh, before I go any further, my name is Ashan Corklin. I'm calling in from Auckland, New Zealand, and I have been invited to join this panel as I am the youth member for Youth of Edinburgh um, on the board here in New Zealand. Uh, we have an incredible group of panelists from around the world, and I'm very excited to hear what they have to say about our topics. Um, but before we go into the structure, I'm just going to read out a little bit um, about our regulations. So, welcome to the SDG Global Festival of Action. Some of you are joining us inside the Zoom webinar, and some of our participants are joining from the festival's virtual event platform. Welcome all. Before we kick off, a bit of housekeeping has been provided by the UN SDG Action Campaign Team. Please all note that this session is part of the SDG Global Festival of Action. So if you're joining here directly in Zoom, we strongly encourage you to log into the event platform afterwards. We'll share the link in the chat if you don't have it already. You can then benefit from joining any one of the six stages meetings and connect with others in the connection zones. Uh, you can also check out up to 20 exhibits and find additional information in the resource library. By joining this webinar, everyone on the panel consents to their image and audio being broadcast. Uh, for those of you joining via Zoom, we have the opportunity here to promote participants, those featured on the screen with their cameras and mic on. If we do that, you also automatically give your consent. We have strict broadcasting regulations here. So if anybody is promoted to have their mics and camera on, uh, please no logos, flags, or music are permitted in the background. And finally, if the broadcasting regulations are broken, we'll need to remove participants. So today's session will work in two sort of ways. We'll have two sessions. The first section uh, will be interactive using the chat and the Q&A session. And um, one of the three moderators will be asking questions to our panelists. The second section will open up and we'll have more of a broad discussion um, between the panelists and hopefully we can have some of your input via the Q&As and polls for that session. During this time, um, James and Maxine will also be answering questions on chat and with the Q&As. So if you have any questions, if you want us to discuss any topics in particular, please feel free to flip through a message and we'll try to get to those. Uh, but, what, but without further ado, I think we'll start with the first question. Uh, the panelists will introduce themselves before they answer a question. Um, and here we go. So this first question is directed for Helga and Freya, and we'll get Helga to answer this first. Um, but COVID-19 has brought about many challenges for young people. Could you briefly tell us about two challenges you have mostly been concerned about? Thank you. Um, my name is Helga Mutastingwa, and I'm from Tanzania, um, member of WADS. Um, so the biggest things I'm concerned about is um, domestic violence. As we know, many people are now full-time locked in with the abusers without um, safe places to go, um, making them scared to report the abuse in fear of being hurt more. And young people are scared of reporting of the abuse, as you might find they are dependent of the abusers. And other places, the girls and young women have been forced to marriages. Children, uh, you know, uh, led to you know child labor, and they're being uh, the young people are victims of physical and social and psychological abuse. And the second uh, big thing that has me concerned you in this global pandemic is poor mental health and well-being. You know, lockdowns and restrictions have meant that young people are deprived of safe spaces, isolated and lonely. So example, closure of universities, schools, isolation, loss of income, which might be due to losing the jobs. So uh, these things have left to massive um, consequences uh, for their well-being, leading to suicidal thoughts 
anxiety, uh, increase in alcohol consumption and substance abuse. So, and remember mental health is still a taboo to most cultures, leading to young people not being comfortable to speak about it or seek help. As, and mental health services across the world remain underfunded, overcrowded and still being ignored. Awesome, thank you. And uh, Freya? Yes, yeah, so I'm Freya Ellipson. I'm a Norwegian scout activist and youth advocate. And I will follow on my two main concerns, uh, which are that of education and employment and how the pandemic has unfairly and disproportionately affected youth in these two groups. So in terms of education, some have been lucky. There has been no change to the education, but those are a minority. For a lot of students, all of their education is now virtual which for some has been a positive experience, but for many has been a letdown, especially those who struggle to access Wi-Fi, a computer and a safe, quiet place in their home to do their schoolwork. For others, again, education has become non-existent and when their schools closed down, they had no other alternative. Um, the risks of those continuing to stay out of school, even after the pandemic is hopefully ended soon, is high and it represents a, a global issue. The pandemic has, it seems, increased the divide between the privileged and the unlucky. And that's a big concern to everyone who cares about youth. Secondly, the start of employment. A lot of young people, just like anyone else, has lost their jobs. However, a lot of young people have those jobs that are less protected to start with. They do informal work and often have loose part-time contracts, which means that they are now less likely to be protected once losing their jobs. We additionally see a lot of state discrimination towards young people in work, where, for example, they are not covered by COVID compensation schemes if they are registered as students in addition, or they are not given PPE because they are considered healthy enough to not need this equipment. Thank you. Awesome, thank you both for those answers. Um, what we'll do now is we'll launch our first poll question. Um, so I think James and Maxine, are one of you going to launch that? Oh, well, here we go. <laughs> So if everyone could answer that question, that would be great. Okay. And the question is, what is your biggest concern about the impact of the pandemic on the lives of young people? Um, and you can add further comments in the chat box and questions on the Q&A platform. It's also a multiple choice question, so feel free to um, add multiple options there if you can't think of just one. So I'm trying to see the answer for this poll. That's okay. Uh, we've got a question here come through in chat um, from Adam. I'm also concerned about the impact of the lack of action on the climate. Uh, So does anyone on the panel want to address that question there? So the question from Adam regarding the uh, lack of action on the climate. Anyone from the panel? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. 
Yes, hi, uh, my name is Bijal. Um, I'm from the UK um, and I'm a member of WAGS. Um, I think climate is also uh, an issue that I'm quite concerned about. And it's uh, one of those things that is very interlinked into a lot of the things that we're talking about as well, um, in terms of uh, employment and education. I think the climate is so involved in how we function as societies that it can't really be forgotten. But I really do fear that um, it is another thing that's being pushed aside as governments try and address the pandemic as kind of the number one thing on their um, agendas. I think it's one of those things that if we don't continue to bring up and talk about, um, especially as young people, it will just be one of those things that's sidelined and policies will continue to be uh, enacted and kind of you know, enforced in the background as the media and the press are covering more kind of, I guess, urgent in their terms um, topics or something that's happening with the, the pandemic or health services. Um, I think it's really easy for governments to justify not spending or prioritizing um, the environment at the moment. I think the pandemic makes it feel like we have to stop and address this and nothing else at the moment. Um, however, I think as young people, we can really try and show how uh, it, isn't, it isn't something that we need to work on in isolation and it can be something that we can use to empower ourselves and find new opportunities for things like employment um, and health and well-being. Um, it, it's a really essential part of all of those things. Thank you. Awesome. Would anyone like to add on to that or have anything yeah, else to if, share? Yeah, if I can just also talk on the all element of climate. I'm uh, Chisa Green from Kenya. You find that uh, during the beginning times of the pandemic, so many, so many countries had enhanced lockdown. So almost everybody was back at home. So with these at some point, we saw how the whole environment was uh, starting to heal in terms of pollution was reducing and uh, and like our normal lifestyle seems to be the biggest harm to to the, to that to the, to, our, to our, our climate. So that was also a time for us to see that if we were to really make a decision that it's not just the pandemic that is going to show us the effects that we cause with our daily lifestyles on, on our climatic conditions then uh, we can just take this lesson and be able to continue doing the same measures in trying to save the environment with each and every activities that we do as uh, the young generation. Because if we are waiting for uh, somebody else to really come and be the change maker, the change making begins with us. So we have to really make the decision, are we just going to let the pandemic be the main reason why we see the environment healing? Why can't we also just maintain what you are going to do to make this, this world a better place in terms of the climate and everything that is around us. So the pandemic was really a wake up call to most of the people in the youth especially. And we saw what really happened during those lockdowns when there's no movement or anything. Is a way the environment began to heal again, that was life. And uh, yeah, something just came in during those times. If for most of you remember the news and the, the penguins and, uh, and just the environment healing back. So we are really, we really need to think about this as youths and what we're going to do about all of this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can I add on to that, Ishan, if we have time? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, uh, I think uh, Trees put it wonderfully. And um, I'm Namrita Sharma and I'm a counseling psychologist by profession. And today I'm representing World by, World by WCA here. Uh, I would like to add on to what Trees had just said that um, actually I just saw the results for the poll right now and uh, most of the people opted for well-being and health. So uh, just to add on to what Trees said is that uh, yes, during the pandemic, the temperatures went down as well as the uh, you know health issues, the number of health issues also went down, um, not considering the cases of COVID, 
but when we talk about respiratory uh, you know respiratory diseases and otherwise uh, in fact in delhi in india we could see um, such less pollution that people could actually uh, see mountains and valleys far far away which they couldn't see earlier and if we if i were to connect the climate change to our well being and health issues i would say that there was a big big uh, difference in our health whether it's the physical or the mental health earlier when the levels of pollution were going up people were having a lot of mental health issues related to frustration anxiety they were you know kind of um, not being able to step out of the house and i personally would say was also having issues of irritation you know irritation in my eyes which was causing irritation to me mentally and uh, that in return was uh, affecting my mental health a lot so there is kind of a link between our health and well being and the climate change and um, i think we should start creating awareness towards that because if we are not living in an healthy environment then i don't think our well being will be you know positively moving forward so yeah Isha? awesome thank you for those answers Excuse um, me. yes can yes, i add something can. else yes please go ahead so um i saw in the comments that many people are talking about education and the challenges that they are facing during this covid situation i am uh, i am zainab dahmul i am from tunisia i am a wax representative and i am a business student so i am a business i am a student excuse me and um what i have to say is that we as students we faced loneliness during covid situation we faced physical isolation and uncertainty about our future so everything i saw in the chat box that many people are talking about uh, how everything is going is being like online um and so uh, this uncertainty about our future is leading to an um, uh, unprecedented wave of mental health issues among us um young people and that um as uh, as namrata said uh, there is um reflecting in serious threats to our lives and well-being um so yeah so education is really uh, related um to mental health and uh, this uh, this is a very um uh, important concern during a covid situation brilliant and i see uh vera you have your hand raised yes it's right hi everyone my name is vera i'm from the netherlands and i'm representing wax as well um and i raised my hand because i wanted to um uh, I react on uh, a comment I saw in the chat because I see Mariana said in the chat, I think it's a mix of these. Education is definitely at the center, but I think I am much more concerned of the inequalities that will stem and extrapolate from this. Uh, looking at the youth all over the world, what is their future looking like? And I, I wanted to, to add to this because I really agree with Mariana that um, for me, my biggest concern as well is that the pandemic has uh, sort of expose the, the existing inequalities that exist in our societies, but it also increased it a lot. And um, whether it's uh, gender inequality, racial inequality, economic inequality, all these things um, are affected by the pandemic. And um, I think we as as the young generation will need to deal with with the long term consequences of the of the pandemic and this increase in inequalities is one of them as well. So I think this is something that we should really take into account that that's a thing and that that is um, the current situation that we will, uh, yeah, we will need to work hard for to, to, to solve that. So I think that's one of the things we should really take into account. Brilliant. Thank you all for your answers and thank you for referring to the chat. Um, I'm sorry, we're going to have to move on to the next section in the interest of time. So I'm going to invite Melissa to take over um, and continue with the panel. Thank you, Ishan. That was a really um, great conversation, I think, that we just had. Um, and I think that there's been no doubt that the last year has been extremely difficult for pretty much all young people. Um, but we were also what we, were, what we also want to do within this panel is have the chance to highlight some of the successes that young people have had in the last year. Um, and you've seen in the last year any number of young people and youth organizations who have stepped up and really involved, been involved and helpful in their communities. Um, I wanted to highlight just a few stories that, that I came across um, in the last few weeks. One was uh, Krishna 
Krishna Mahashwai, who worked on providing free families, a free aid to families in Pakistan, especially targeted toward women and widows, uh, who's an especially vulnerable community or a group um, in the last year. Then there's the Community Development for Peace founder, Muhammad Fedao in Bangladesh, who used his organization to distribute dry foods and sanitation, sanitation kits to everyday laborers like the street vendors and uh, rickshaw pullers. And then you had Bernardo Ornos Moscoso in Ecuador, who used her, her role as a legal advisor to kind of push the National Assembly of Ecuador to secure funding for COVID-19, for a COVID-19 response. And after her, her, her pushing, uh, the political parties decided to take the funding that they had set aside for uh, election campaigning and put it to a specific COVID-19 response stimulus package. Um, and, and in a broader sense, you've had young people who've been really active in the digital space, combating disinformation campaigns. You've had a lot of youth organizations involved um, in the international campaign Youth Against COVID-19, where they map and they share fact-checking websites and other resources. And you see a lot of national campaigns as well in different countries, such as Quedate and Casa in Mexico. So there's, there's a lot of numerous examples of young people who've been really active um, in, in volunteering and trying to help the local communities. So I wanna give the other panelists a chance to also share some of their success stories. Um, and I think we'll start with Zainab and then we'll go to Namrata. Do you wanna go ahead, Zainab? Hi everyone, um, thank you, Melissa. So my name is Zainab Dahmul, I'm a WAGS representative. So before starting, I wanna say that um, scouting movement volunteers around the world say, always say, what scouts do is not a burden, but a service. The secret behind this statement um, is that we are doing everything we do with a bunch of our love of giving and our belief in the importance of uh, doing our duty towards others. So um, here, here in Tunisia, so during the COVID-19 situation, our Tunisian expatriates, uh, they, uh, they didn't go to their usual destinations, which are their homes, but instead they went to a prejudged compulsory quarantine center. Um, they went in desperately confused about how would they survive all the 14 days alone in a center. They had no idea that our volunteers, the scouts, the scout leaders, were waiting for them with a reassuring smile and gentle hearts that were looking forward to support them during this intense time. We never get tired, never get bored. Hard work is our motto. This is one of the chants that our young people uh, repeat while climbing mountains or hiking kilometers in forest. But today, um, we hear these words coming loudly from the Tunisian scouts um, who are like, or, or scouts from all over the world. Sweat is poured out from the forehead. This is a result of the effort and dedication to duty. Scouts were ensuring food to their local community and making them happy. The scout is always ready to serve everyone. And even during this critical period, we saw that our volunteer heroes spared no efforts to facilitate the lives of citizens. Um, so the meeting of forums builds the homeland and the meeting of hearts relieves adversity. This crisis succeeded in gathering hearts and melting efforts in the service of human beings. The leaders of the the leaders of the scouts and girl guides and the volunteers of, of uh, the Red Crescent are joining hands in order to make uh, this crisis pass with least damages. They perfectly uh, showed how much cooperation of civil society entities across the country is important. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zainab. Uh, Namrata, if you wanna go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Melissa. Um, Zainab, that was amazing. It was really good to hear about all the work that has been done during the pandemic. And um, like I mentioned, I am a representative of World by WCA, which means that I will be today talking about all the work, uh, especially with women from the Asia Pacific region with, with whom I've been working. Um, our work began, uh, we came together during the SRHR project, that is the Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights Project. And I got to know uh, young leads from Nepal, uh, Myanmar, uh, from Japan, uh, Nepal, uh, 
I think I mentioned that twice. So um, all of us came together and we began uh, doing campaigns. And during that journey, I came across so many good things that they were doing to help the women or the children or the community around them. Out of them, I would like to mention a few success stories um, wherein sisters, our sisters from Nepal, YWCA Nepal, participated in relief distribution, whether it was food rationing, it was clothing or sanitary, um, you know, sanitary products for women during the pandemic, which was initiated and led by the sisters alone. They completely ran this program single-handedly. Apart from that, our sisters from Philippines also um, initiated a project where they did the similar kind of work of relief distribution. And um, also there was, uh, I would like to mention, there was, there was a typhoon in Philippines while the, uh, you know, the pandemic was going on. But despite that, our sisters from the Philippines uh, especially Marla and Jewel kept on, uh, you know, conducting series of webinars where they were interacting with young women and children on different kinds of issues, whether it was SRHR or uh, mental health or, you know, gender-based violence. Some other cases um, were where, wherein online listening group uh, group sessions for youth were conducted, wherein they were given the safe space to share with, um, you know, with people who were in that profession, in the mental health profession, so that they could, uh, like earlier, uh, someone mentioned that isolation was a big, big issue during the pandemic. And during these youth sessions, these youngsters were able to share their problems and they were then directed to respective professionals or personnel where they could seek further help. Apart from that, um, social media was a big hit during the pandemic. It had its pros and it had its cons. Um, however, in our case, I feel um, it has it had several pros where it brought together so many of us, you know, from different countries. Even today, so many of us are joining together from different parts of the world. Um, and we uh, created pages online where we tried to connect on different issues such as SRHR, gender-based violence, education, menstrual hygiene, and we kept the work going. And um, I just feel social media was a huge, huge help. Uh, we have been doing regional and global, the global campaign is still going on. And um, I personally con connected with a lot of people throughout India where I conducted, uh, you know, trainings and webinars on mental health issues that arise due to ban due during the pandemic because believe it or not another pandemic that we all are facing right now is the mental health pandemic um, and I really feel that uh, it needs to be taken care of and needs to be highlighted even more so yeah these are some of the success stories and um, yeah I think there are a lot more but for now that's it thank you for letting me share Thank you, Namrata. Um, we do have to move on to the next section, so I'm going to hand it over to Freya. Thank you very much to hear all of those success stories. It's nice to get some positive as well. Um, I am going to start the second poll now. We're getting loads of interesting questions, both in the chat and Q&A. Um, but to focus, the second poll um, is about, it's linking to the questions. It's about government and civil society organizations. And in specifically, do you think your government and civil society organizations in your community have done enough to cushion young people against the impact of COVID-19? You can either comment in the chat box or in the Q&A option as well. And whilst people are voting, do we, does anyone in the panel want to share their points on or share a further success story maybe or answer something in the chat? Melissa, your hand is up. Yes, yeah, sorry, I know you guys just heard my voice, but um, I do realize I actually forgot to introduce myself. I'm Melissa Ballard. I currently am residing in Bonn, Germany, but I'm from the United States originally, and I'm the founder of the United States Youth Forum. Um, and I think this is a very interesting question in that um, there's no doubt that governments have done their best to shield people from the effects of the pandemic, but I'm not sure how much of that is targeted to young people, especially in different age groups. 
Um, and I think the reason why we can't know that is because I think there needs to be more reporting done on the effects of COVID-19 on specific types of age groups and on specific issues before you can target aid more directly, or not, not just aid, but also help in certain areas. Um, with that being said, there I think there are broad, broader areas um, where government could be doing better. One of them is education, and that was mentioned earlier as a, as a concern for many people. And I think you cannot, you can't really always de-link education from, from employment, or at least socioeconomic prospects that young people are looking towards. I mean, people, young people between the ages of, of 15 to 30 have faced two major economic crises and crises in general in the, la in the last 10, 12 years of their life. Um, and so I think that, that for young people who are facing an educational crisis right now, and I think that young people who are, who, who are losing the quality of education, even if they're in school, uh, they're looking at this negatively impacting the socioeconomic, socioeconomic futures, in addition to already uh, having already faced a crisis in 2008 and already being set back by this current crisis. So I think that the government could be doing more um, to specifically target young people and, and the socioeconomic futures that are ahead of them. Thank you very much. It seems we are still waiting for the results. We have a question in the Q&A about how young people activism react to, how can young people react to the COVID-19 pandemic and how can online and remote activism be optimised and made better? Is there anyone in the panel who wants to comment on how we can do activism online? Namarata? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, online has uh, the online mode has been one of the fastest spreading mode uh, during the pandemic or otherwise. And there is a lot that you can do. You can create, uh, like, for example, if I were to talk about our Asian leaders, uh, they created pages and um, they've had like these five to seven day campaigns where they have been promoting different kinds of issues. Like I mentioned earlier, whether like very simple ones, uh, maybe sexually transmitted diseases, because not a lot of youngsters know about it. And uh, currently with the education going online, sex education has kind kind of just taken a pause or a you know back seat as other um, education subjects are slightly more important and you know you can uh, start having live chats with people who are influential um, it's slightly difficult to reach out to these um, personalities but uh, you can have group discussions on uh, the internet where you can interact with other youngsters uh, you can create posters wherein which you know create some sort of awareness again it can be about menstrual hygiene it can also be about um, issues with men it's not just about women it's about everyone and whatever you feel is currently relevant or needs to be spotted on uh, yeah so there and webinars are always a huge help group sessions are another way where you can promote awareness or use online mode yeah. thank you very much so we got the answer from the Pull back, and the overwhelming answer was no, with 69%. So that's no to thinking that government and civil society has done enough. What do you think, panel? Is this an interesting or surprising comment? Or, or do you agree with all the attending that uh, I, government and I civil society should be doing more? Please raise your hands for response, either. Yes, Tracy. Yeah, uh, I think uh, when 69% are like disagree with government, you know that for my country, I also tend to feel the same about the Kenyan government. Yeah, it did so well in terms of uh, trying to enlighten everyone about the pandemic and the whole idea that you're supposed to keep some distance 1.5 meters away from each other and wear masks. But if it comes to the main issues that uh, we were going through as the youth in terms of unemployment and, uh, and, and hunger and uh, mental health, there is something that instead of my government trying to help us with, it made worse. Because if 
if you are not able to provide for, uh, for, for, uh, for the people food, then by the end of the day, what is going to happen? We are going to start, uh, the crime is going to increase. People are going to start stealing from each other. And uh, to an extent that there is that time that we had even a live interview of a lady who was cooking stones just to ensure that the kids can be able to go to sleep, just thinking that they, to expect that there's food, but there's no food. So just having a fire and boiling those stones was something that this lady was doing and so many people are going through this. So I feel like my government might have been able to provide food for at least most of the people. And uh, the fact that we also got a lot of donors also helping us during that time as a country, but it really didn't do much in terms of helping the people of this country. Instead, we only saw, uh, we only saw them having their fair share, but not really being concerned about the major people, the people who really needed their help. There's really nothing that was done by our government in terms of that. And so that's why that poor result is something that I agree with right now. I feel like they could have done more. Thank you very much. I think a lot of people can recognize that feeling. So for the last three minutes of this topic, I would like to give the word first to Ishan and then to Sarindra uh, before moving on. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I think I've got a fairly unique perspective on this issue because as fairly well publicized, New Zealand's done quite well with the pandemic because of our government's response for a large part of it, um, but also our ge geographic location. Um, but something that you, you can't help overlook is even with New Zealand, who has had such a good response, is that there wasn't much um, consideration of youth itself. So the idea was try return business first. And then if the business was to return, then everything else would fall back into place, which is interesting because with a lot of business environments, they talk about this new business as usual. And we have that here in New Zealand too, where more companies are going to working from home and whatsoever. However, our education systems have, have literally not changed. It is exactly the same. So even though we had all these other parts of society move towards um, a new normal and take through lessons that they saw worked during the pandemic, it seems like with a lot of youth issues, um, it was try return to exactly what we were doing before the pandemic. And in a lot of cases, we didn't use this as the opportunity it could have been um, to set new standards. So that's my two cents on that topic. Yeah, thank you, Sham. Um, so basically, uh, I'm again, uh, Thayinda Arma Perma from Sri Lanka, and I'm one of the emerging leaders for the Jacob Edinburgh Award. Um, so just to comment on that, about the 69%, which we just saw, um, I would like to say how young people sort of utilize the time in Sri Lanka, but how, um, you know, undermined or like how the government didn't sort of like captivate it and like use it for future potential. So one thing was that young people got a, got a lot of time to sort of invest in innovations and entrepreneurship opportunities. And they really, I really saw young people innovating different hand washing machines and like, um, different business ideas, incubation programs, this and whatnot. So one of the main concerns were if the government could have recognized these opportunities, it would have been so brilliant to see, um, you know, young people being motivated and more young people coming into this uh, platform to sort of showcase their talents. So that was one of the concerns. And also, like Namrata said, and there's millions and different ways of doing activism online. And even, even, uh, during the pandemic, one thing I saw was activism was mostly done by uh, non-governmental organizations and youth organizations. So mostly what I saw was uh, the inspiration or the impact-driven um, um, way of living was mostly done by uh, all these organizations rather than a part of the government. So it was mainly, I'm not really sure if it was too much on the plate for them to handle because of the pandemic, but uh, uh, the side of focusing on young people and mental health was really kind of neglected and um, the hotline saw the numbers which were supposed to call, they were all not working, which were offered by um, the government and young people had no one to sort of look up to other than the respective organization. So just imagine a young person being a part of the organ being a part of an organization, but what happens to the people who are not a part of the organization and who doesn't have a voice to speak up? So I think there's more um, organizations and governments collectively can uh, do for young people. So definitely, um, thank you guys.
Thank you so much both for the questions and the answers. I'll now hand the mic to the wonderful Helga again, who will take us through to the last poll. Thank you, Freya. Um, so I have the next session that comes and I want to pose the question to all of you. Um, do you think the role of young people is significant in the fight against COVID-19? And if so, what else to be done? So um, you can still share your opinion and uh, there's a poll that you can actually choose if you think you see there's a role that uh, young people have played and it's very significant against COVID-19. And you can also give um, examples and you can add um, other comments in the chat or ask questions. So with the experience of that, you know, the stories that have come up and the things that people have contributed or have done during this COVID-19, that there's something that is, most of the things that have been significant, I would say, and I would, try, I would want to give an example of, uh, of a student who actually um, created a, a, a machine, like hand washing machine, which you could just press using your hands. So that means you won't touch the tap. And they were, actually the government was able to, um, you know, collaborate with him and get all the tools, you know, and produce them in large numbers and got to be distributed along the public, uh, public places. And this young person was actually, you know, appreciated and probably motivated more. So that's something that he played a role in, you know, we were like wash hands, sanitize. In our communities, water was easily accessible, but then how do you get to keep it in public places? There was no lockdown, I think, if you had in Tanzania for a long time. So this actually helped us to keep on washing hands and continue with other activities that um, were actually happening. So um, the panel, if somebody else can just um, share the experience or show um, share examples while we see if other participants are still watching. Can, can I yeah. uh, Sure. Zena, Zena? please go. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So um, um, thank you, Helga, for giving uh, this example. I'm going to as well give the example um, of um, a bunch of uh, young people here in Tunisia. So during the confinement, when people uh, were in their uh, homes, they were not allowed to go out. Uh, there were like uh, young people who volunteered to buy any uh, thing that family needed that time, and they they bought uh, they bought like anything you want, and they uh, and they bring it to, to your home. It and it is a voluntary work. I mean, you are just there are like green uh, numbers, phone numbers, like there are a list of phone numbers. You just call that uh, that number, and and in few minutes or in an hour. Uh, all what you ordered is uh, is there in your home without going out. It is. It was um, to, to to encourage people to stay at their homes. But I really uh, um, I really was surprised by uh, by these uh, young people who really volunteered, uh, who were really courageous to go out during that time during the uh, lockdown and and all. So so they really uh, uh, did brilliant work. Thank you, Zainab. Um, Namrata? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Helga. Um, I think our answer lies in the question here. First of all, everyone knows that amongst the entire, you know, uh, generations, the younger generation is one of the most immune to COVID. Um, I would say that from researchers because people have said that the old and the younger children are less immune but that does not mean that it makes us superheroes we are obviously we can uh, catch the virus but we are one of the healthier ones whether it is mentally or it is physically so yes the younger generation can play a huge role whether it is in um, activism is in promoting some sort of, uh, you know, awareness towards an issue, whether it's doing physical work, like Zainab just said, gave wonderful examples. And um, as the younger generation has an, a mindset where they want to do something for themselves, 
everyone has a dream everyone when they reach their younger age or adolescence or their young adulthood they want to do something in life they need to have a purpose so what better than having to help somebody else and i feel if you create this as one of your purposes in life it will take you forward and might maybe you just start like to me also i started enjoying activism so much i never knew that i would step out of my psychology background and use it in a place where i can actually help people so activism is um, a wonderful way you can whether you're a ca you are in banking you can help people create bank accounts who need it you know tiny little things you can do that can um, you know help another person is also like doing something good from your end is something great so yeah yes the response is the answer is right here in my in front of us it is it says yes 94% so helga please take over that was my response thank you this is really a uh, nice um examples and you can see that um young people uh that have played a very big role in fighting against uh, covid-19 so um bijal if you uh, share please yes thank you um i think it's really encouraging that people believe that we can play a role in this um i think one of the the biggest things um about young people as a group is that we're so motivated to try and help um and i think you know we've talked about all these great innovations that people have made in different parts of the world but one of the things that is really powerful that we can all do is just continue talking about these issues and that's you know to your friends to your family on social media um we need to keep conversations going about uh whatever it is that is concerning us about the state of our education about the climate about how we're staying healthy sharing what we're doing with our communities because it's the only way to kind of it's one of the only ways we can show solidarity in a time when we're all really just connected by the digital you know it's it's very difficult for us to to meet and meet people in a in a space that share you know similar views on things um and i've had a lot of young people reach out to me lately asking me um about particular uh, charities to support regarding certain issues or how they can help about certain things or where they can learn about certain topics and i think that's uh, one of the most important things if you're feeling frustrated about something go and find out about it go and find out what other people are doing um, in your community around the world and share those ideas because that's the only way for them to grow into something bigger thank you thank you b um thanks for also sharing that what can else be done and that's a very good advice um uh if um vera could just share just a little bit of uh, what you want to share and then we go to freya or bay she'll close yes of course yeah i think it's really encouraging that, that everyone almost voted uh, yes and i really agree that we can have a, a good impact as young people and especially when we uh, can bundle our powers together to to have one voice for example in the youth organizations that gather today in this in this meeting because if we can state our opinion in one voice we can also make that voice heard to for example the governments and that sort of adds to the to the previous question as well because i don't know about other countries but in the netherlands the government isn't that young and that might also be the reason why um young people are sort of missing out on on some of the the covid response and i think because we're not in the government ourselves as young people in general these organizations are really crucial to um to have an impact thank you thank you vera um i just so a uh, comment uh, it's a question how can we keep our mental health or ourselves from burnout while doing so many activities during this covid-19 pandemic i think that's something that most of us have been asking ourselves or what should we do uh, be just given an example on how you can you know volunteer there's a com this question this comment was from um nuru where they uh, the name uh 
say that, you know, through volunteering and activism um, has helped, you know, with young people in mental health um, management, I would say. So um, that's something that can be spoken about. Maybe another panelist, uh, Trees, uh, sorry, Freya. Sure, yeah, I think it's a really good point that we, we very often look at young people as these persons who are going to solve everything. And it is important to recognize that in order to solve everything, we need to protect ourselves and take care of ourselves too. It doesn't have to be um, in a way that's hurtful to others, but I do think it's important. Personally, um, what I find is really good is, is, as people have mentioned before as well, to team up. Uh, it's a lot harder to do things by yourself. And whether you're just teaming up with uh, two or three people in your local community and try to do something positive or whether or not you're joining one of the six biggest youth organizations in the world, I think it doesn't really matter as long as you, you find people who uh, can help push you forward and help you stay motivated even though your education is online or you're unemployed. Um, so yes, that would be my one point to find someone who can help push you forward and be in it together. And also recognize that you don't need to save the world every single day. It is okay to, to have some days off where maybe you just go out and you enjoy the weather if it's okay. Thank you so much. Um, Tarindra? Uh, sorry, oh, it's me or, oh, Tarindra, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so basically it was about- uh, Tarindra? Uh, yeah, and, and um, I personally was going through this thing and I'd, I'd never even thought I had anxiety, but then yes, I, I really found out that I have anxiety and then there was this pin needling pain, all of these. Sometimes you don't think that these problems are going to come for you just because you advocated, but definitely that's the, that's the reality. It just hits us sometimes, you know? And then I saw, uh, what I did was I took some time off from work because it's like the digital well-being that also sort of affects this because we because we're at home we're twenty four seven probably looking at at our laptops and sometimes we don't have the nine to five off times so we are constantly being sent these work so it's kind of like overburdening some overburdening sometimes and this can really impact family relationships personal relationships. And that can be a lot as a young person to take because we are also in the process of experiential learning as well. So one of the tips I would give, which I myself tried, uh, which was um, immense self-care tips, because I, I really found uh, focusing on myself, trying to have a little bit of a me time uh, in between work and have my own spot, trying to have little pleasures on little things. And also like focusing on read focusing on what really makes me happy apart from work and apart from all these things that flows to our head and constantly making us stressed, looking at the Google calendars or emails, you know? Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so basically it's very important that you take care of yourself because one of the things I also talk about education system is that, um, so this is an example from Sri Lanka. We have a uh, health, uh, hold as um, health is spiritual, mental, and um, physical well-being. But in our textbooks, we only have physical well-being. And my constant question is, where is the spiritual and mental well-being? And when we are facing a time like this, which is certainly like a pandemic, and Namrata perfectly said a mental health pandemic as well, how are we knowing what to cope up with? So it's very important that the government also and policymakers also address these points because um, we really don't know how to self do self-care if we are not being taught about it as well. So thanks to like internet being out there, we can definitely search. But also I would recommend if you have any help of uh, going for therapy or like psychologists, getting any help from a counselor, uh, I think Namrata can perfectly help on, on this question mm -hmm. as well. Um, just feel free to reach out to them. And if there's any online uh, support groups, please feel free to join them as well, because I'm also actively participating in one of them as well. So try to take care of yourself in this much needed times. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tarindra. Um, I also want to hear more, but due to time, um, I just noticed that more young people do appreciate that we are contributing more uh, during this time. 
let's keep on doing that. And how do we get to collaborate or participate more? Um, I'd welcome Freya to, to give us more information on that. Thank you. Um, so if you want to help fight COVID and uh, maybe even make sure that the new society which is being built is better than the one we leave behind. Um, in other words, if you're interested in youth-led COVID response and recovery advocacy, as well as action and capacity building, I would really, really, really recommend going into big sits Dot org, that's six as in the number, to learn more about the global youth mobilization and how millions of young people across the world are trying to make a better world for everyone. And with that, I would like to thank everyone for participating. Uh, it's been great to see the fantastic engagement. And I'm so sorry we didn't have time to go through every single question in the Q&A or in the chat. I hope all of these discussions will continue long, long after the Zoom meeting has ended. Also, thank you very much to the panelists. Um, I was always super impressed with everyone's experience. And with that, that's my last note. Thank you and goodbye to everyone. Thank you.